From VQR and the Center for Media and Citizenship, this is episode 13 of Circle of Willis, where I'm talking with Nalanjana Dasgupta about how young women interested in STEM disciplines can benefit from women teachers and mentors. We also talk about Nalanjana's fascinating family history that for generations has combined science and social activism. So what did you do first? The first study, which I'm going to actually present here, yeah. looked at whether in gateway courses that are required for all STEM majors, like calculus. Yeah, like yeah, or the, the, the initial chem series or something like that. Yes, those kinds so of, this was yeah. the initial calc 1, 2, 3, mm-hmm. calculus 1, 2, yeah. 3 series. Does the gender of the professor teaching the class have an effect on female students differentially than male students? Does it affect how much these students like mathematics? Does it affect how much they identify with it? Does it affect their self-efficacy, what grade they think they'll get in the class? Does it affect how much they identify with the professor? All of these things. You're listening to Nalanjana Dasgupta, professor of psychology at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst, where she also serves as director of faculty equity and inclusion. I spoke with Nalanjana at a small conference in upstate New York about how learning environments affect whether women who enter college interested in the STEM disciplines actually stick with those disciplines or decide to do something else instead. Many of you will know that STEM stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, and Math. And you may also know that women are underrepresented in STEM by huge margins. Here in part one of this episode, Nalanjana talks about the origins of this work how she discovered the effect of women mentors for young women in these disciplines. And she also gets us up to date on her latest attempt to use this knowledge to develop targeted interventions designed to encourage young women interested in STEM to stick with it. Later, in part two, Nalanjana tells the story of her family history, a history of science and social activism that begins in India and influences her choices step by step to the work she's doing today. We'll also hear about some of her earlier work on what psychologists call implicit biases, the attitudes, beliefs, or stereotypes thought by some to be guiding our actions unconsciously. All right? Okay, let's get back to the conversation. It took us three years to get enough women from these classes, and we found these robust effects where the gender of of these calculus professors had no effect on male students in terms of their implicit attitudes towards mathematics, how much they liked, how much implicitly, how much they identified with math, their self-efficacy, their predictions about what grade they would get, Uh no effect on men. No effect at all. Didn't matter. But it had a huge effect on women. So women who were in sections taught by female professors identified with math significantly more than if their professors happened to be male. They liked mathematics much more when the professor was female than when the professor was male. They predicted they would get a better grade in calculus when their professor was female than male. In terms of actual grades, women actually outperformed male students. When there was a female instructor? Regardless of the instructor. Oh my God. So essentially that showed that performance was not what was affected by being a small minority in your class. Rather, it was confidence that was fragile. It was confidence that was bumping up and down depending on whether you saw someone like you in front of the class. But your actual performance wasn't affected. But the reason why confidence matters is if you, don't, if you think you're an imposter, even if you're doing pretty well, you're not going to stick around because you think it's bad. an accident. Yeah. And you think that you did well because it's a fluke, because you got lucky, because the exam was easy. You don't trust that it has something to do with your ability. So the likelihood of somebody who feels like an imposter switching out of that major into a different major is really high. This is, this, I mean, it, it brings it to mind a bunch of things, but it yeah. almost sounds a little bit, you know, Schachter and Singerish, right? You know, it's like oh, you're having this, what you're having this sense of this feeling, yeah. and you've got to explain the feeling, and so your explanation is, I must not be very good at this, yes. rather than 
something that's in fact far more complicated, yeah. which is that, you know, I, I'm in this sort of sociocultural moment and I'm having a, a male instructor who is, yeah. is behaving in a way that, I mean, I don't know what, what is, so, what is it about male instructors and female instructors that's making this difference? Two things. One, we, can't, we couldn't tell from that experiment, but from future subsequent experiments, what we know that it's doing is that in a, in a context where you are the only one or one of very few and everybody else is very different from you, like these calculus classes, the critical ingredients it looks like are two things, feelings of belonging. So this is the social connectivity. Yeah. So feelings of belonging plummet when... It's a difficult class, and there are very few people like you. And that increases the likelihood that you will make internal attributions for difficulty rather than external attributions to the material or external attributions that everybody else, everybody is having difficulty. So feelings of belonging is one mechanism, and self-efficacy is another mechanism. If there's nobody like you or very few people like you, and stuff is tough, self-efficacy becomes really shaky. And at some point of time, that sort of fragile self-efficacy predicts switching out into another major. And it almost seems like they could be linked in a way. You know, this yeah. is part of, you know, uh, you know our, our perspective from, from yeah. our lab might suggest that the, the feeling of belonging can support efficacy. You're right. In, in yeah. part by reducing cognitive load in a way, you know, by getting all of this rumination out of the way so you can just focus on what you're yeah. doing. Yeah. So, I mean, I don't know if you're, that's true. You're, 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 tr- you're right that belonging and self efficacy are correlated. But when we do these multiple mediation tests, uh, this is from a different study on uh-huh. mentoring, the recent PNAS paper, yeah. where we looked at the effect of mentors, same gender versus other gender mentors on outcomes like career aspirations in engineering, mediated through self-efficacy and belonging, both were independent mediators. Wow. So nothing trumped the other, but they are correlated. Can we talk about that new yes, PNAS yes, yes, paper a yes. little bit? Can you walk us through it a yeah, little bit? Yeah, The gist of this whole program of research is something I call a social vaccine hypothesis or stereotype inoculation. The idea is, just as a biomedical vaccine protects and inoculates our physical body yeah. against noxious bacteria, <laughs> so too, exposure to experts and peers from one's own group inoculate one's mind against noxious stereotypes. So those experts that- and peers function as social vaccines for the self. It's so interesting because it carries forward. I mean, if it's really acting like a vaccine, yes. it's something that alters you internally yes. as you as you go forward. That's what you're suggesting. It's not forward. just about right. the current context, That's although right. the current context probably also has an effect, yeah. just like being exposed to an illness yes. you know, uh, might, might have a, yeah. a current effect. Yes. So we did, so the, this PNAS paper, yeah. we wanted to test social vaccines, but we wanted <laughs> to test their long-term effects. So we already had these papers showing that professors, experts, people in the field who are already successful can act as a social vaccine and inoculate women in mathematics, in engineering, in science. We had that. Simply by being. Simply by being there in person. There in person, interacting. Or by reading a biography of a person on a website. Stop it. Come on. Yes. What are you talking about? Yes. So... I'm listening to you tell me yeah. the story and I cannot help but think about your grandmother and your mother right off the yeah. bat in your personal history. It's not an accident that kids of scientists are more likely to become scientists yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. than kids who don't have a scientist in the family. Right? Right, right. And so women who have scientists or engineers as parents or siblings <coughs> are more likely to succeed in this field. Now, social environment is one. Who knows what other maybe biological influences there might be. But I think that social vaccine idea is a big one. But the in- So the reason I call them you know, I don't call them role models, is because when I asked these women in the calculus study, how much do you like or whatever your your professors, they liked their male and female professors equally. Equally. 
equally. Because there's good people yeah. out there. They were good professors. Yeah. They were, they were great. We observed them in class. They were great. But it's not about liking. It's about identification. It's about identification. Yeah. Yeah. And can so, I okay. be like that? Can, can I, be, can like I that? be that? Yeah. So the more they identified with their female professors, the more they felt that they were confident in mathematics. But for students in sections taught by male professors of calculus, identifying with him had no bearing on their confidence, flatline. So one line goes up, nice correlation between their identification with the female math professors and their own confidence in mathematics, their own self-efficacy, a flat line for, for male professors. So wow. fast forward. Fast forward. Fast forward. So now we are talking about this longitudinal social yes. vaccine. Yeah. One question was, can peers function as social vaccines? So somebody who is just a year older than me. So I am a first-year student in engineering. I have a student who is, I have a, a mentor who is a junior or a senior. Can that person be a social vaccine? Yeah. Question number one. Right. Two, is mentoring enough as long as it's good mentoring? Or does the gender similarity matter? My prediction was that it would matter. Question number three, once the vaccine is done... Does the effect last beyond these the vaccine? These are great questions. Right? So the answer to these questions was that the same the mentoring by itself was not necessarily where the action was. It was question number two, same gender mentoring for women in engineering where the action was. We measured their multiple uh, variables, so feelings of belonging, self-efficacy, career yeah. aspirations. Yeah. We got their grades, looked at retention in engineering, all of that stuff. Right. We randomly assigned these women in August or September when they walked it into UMass. And uh, as, as freshmen? As, yes. Freshmen, freshmen. Yeah, first year students. them right, right, right then. When, yeah, that's Sometimes great. it was during orientation. Oh, they had good. Classes hadn't even started. <laughs> that was our baseline that's measure, excellent. right? excellent. Then we had recruited over the summer seen juniors and seniors in engineering to be mentors. Yeah. We didn't tell them it, that the study had anything to do with gender. The mentors were 50% men, 50% women. We trained them. We told them they would get um, a, a, like three mentees each, that we wanted to meet with them one-on-one. -on -one. We trained them on, we ran a focus group on the host of stuff that they could do. We told them that their primary goal was to be their friend. Um, Interesting. And that in being their friend and helping them adjust to college, they would probably find out things that, that their mentee needed and they could use any of the options that we had taught them about based on what their mentee needed. And they were asked to meet once a month, keep this online diary talking about what, where they met, how long they met for, what did they talk about, uh, what was their perception of their, of their mentee. Um, this went on for a year. A year? A year. So they met no more than eight times. Actually, most of them met only four times, twice in the wow. fall and twice in the spring. Stop it. And other than that, it was some texts, some emails, that's it. We tracked the mentees' progress middle of their fall semester, end of their spring semester, so three times in the first year. Then the mentees graduated from college. The men mentors. The mentors yeah. graduated from college. So the mentoring relationship ended. Yeah. We kept track of the mentees once a year till graduation. So the PNAS paper Unbelievable. is the first two years of data. Okay. And what we find is that from year one, from the beginning to end of year one, feelings of belonging in engineering for women with female mentors hold steady. There's uh -huh. no change. Those with male mentors or no mentors, feelings of belonging drop sharply. Oh, my God. Self-efficacy, same. Self-efficacy or confidence in their own engineering ability, if you have a female mentor, remains steady. Self-efficacy for the other two groups drops. Oh, my God. Career aspirations, same thing. Threat and challenge, so the ratio of anxiety to motivation. Anxiety remains steady for those with female mentors. Anxiety relative to motivation, goes up for those with male mentors and control condition. The, what's interesting is that on some outcome variables, for example, thoughts about switching majors, any mentors makes a difference. But on most dependent variables, retention, belonging, anxiety, the male mentor condition is no different from the control condition. 
the flashiest numbers are in retention, 100% retention at the end of their first year in college for these students who had women mentors. 100%? 82% in the control S- condition. Okay. You're killing me now. <laughs> That's 80, a, that, you're 89%. talking about effect size, 89%? 89%. So I'm sorry, 89% in the control condition, 82% in the male mentor condition. No difference between 82 and 89. Both are significantly different from 100%. Um, so I'm going to just pretend yeah. I'm a upper level college administrator yep. now, or maybe a dean of an engineering department. Exactly the um, person I want to influence. Yes. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to freak out if I see those numbers. Are so you getting freaking out? I'm getting freaking out from my provost. Good. From the university provost. High five, um, provost. Yes. So... I gave this talk at this this distinguished faculty lecture where both the chancellor and the provost were there. And both of them commented on it. And then the provost said to me that she wants to have the dean of computer science, engineering, and natural sciences. She wants me to do a little mini presentation for those three deans and have me identify sort of the best interventions that I think would make a difference in terms of recruitment, retention, student success, and then have these deans essentially adopt them for all three colleges. So you're moving now toward a real intervention. That's that, right. But, you know, you kind of did it. I you did it. You kind of as did a, an intervention. I mean, it's random, yeah. randomly assigned, yep. right? Yeah. But and now it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be, it would be essentially scaled up. To right. the whole yeah. to the whole college yeah. of engineering instead oh of 150. I want to do it at UVA. First of all, the the fact that you're getting these effects with women yeah. in STEM, we all know that women in STEM are underrepresented mm-hmm. systematically, and there's been lots of debate. Yeah. There's Larry Summers kind of dumbass quote, yeah. and <laughs> sorry, Larry, <laughs> you're supposed to talk like this. <laughs> Good thing that you have an editor. <laughs> I'll leave it in. But what strikes me as particularly exciting about this is that you, because you looked at women in STEM, mm-hmm. you're not just looking at it all over. You're, no. you're targeting a specific domain yeah. where we know there's a yeah. problem. And even more specifically, not in the life sciences, right. where women are 40, 45% of the student body. Uh, not the faculty, but the student body, and sometimes 50%. So I'm specifically targeting physical science and engineering departments. So engineering, mathematics, physics, computer science. I'm targeting departments and colleges, our engineering is a college at UMass, where the percentage of women is less than 20%. So in engineering, 16% of students nationwide are women. And that's the same percentage at UMass. In computer science, the number is worse. It's like 15, 14% are women. This is 50% of the population. 56% of college students are women. And 16% of engineering students are women. The gap is huge. And it didn't start out that way. I read somewhere that early in the, the early days of in computer, computer science, science, it, didn't start it out was way. very yeah. equitable in terms of numbers, yeah. and it sort of tumbled off at some point. Yeah, computer science was seen as, if you've seen Hidden Figures, computer science, that movie, computer science was seen as a women's field. Yes. Because computers were sort of seen as... Secretarial secretarial, work. Secretarial work. And then when it became a non... When it became sort of more masculine... More or macho. less, then suddenly, so it, that's actually a, the history of computer science and who's in it is a great example of why... It's a social psychological question of how who occupies that space is a function of what gender stereo, gendered stereotypes we have about computer science. This is amazing work. And also, it also uh, really illustrates how direly important. I mean, I'm just finishing up my tenure yeah. in my department as the yeah. director of diversity and inclusion. And we have oh, these really? meetings all the time, yes. you know, about about, uh, you know, how to change the system. Yeah. That's one set of questions. But my God, whether the system needs to be changed. It's so important to have top-down representation in terms of diversity. But you know, there's something really hopeful in what you've got going yeah. here too. It's it, because that change in the faculty is yeah. going to take exactly. 20, it's 30 years. It's going to take years. a long time. But the mentors mm-hmm. is so lovely. Yeah. The student mentors is yeah. such a lovely, lovely so idea. There are like six takeaways 
for organizations and universities that care about diversity and inclusion. Let's hear them. One is increased contact between entering students in fields where they are way outnumbered with faculty like them whether it be female faculty for female students or faculty of color for students of color and so on. Two, it is true, and this is a long slog, that that sort of contact between female professors and new students is particularly likely to be effective if we hire more women if we in those hire. fields. That's true. Three, even when the numbers are small, leverage peers as mentors and and foster mentoring relationships. But in doing those mentoring relationships, ensure that the mentors have are similar to the mentees, especially if the mentees are, are underrepresented. So mentoring is three. Four, when the numbers are small, use other ways to showcase the success of technical women. It may be through having guest speakers in class. It may be by faculty, male faculty, showcasing the research of a particular female scientist or engineer. And incidentally, sort of showing a picture of her and just describing her work as a case study of what they're teaching. But the fact that they show her not him, essentially is a very incidental, small way of saying that the person who did the science is a woman. So that's, th- that's four. And five is teamwork, which we didn't talk about, that for classes that involve team science or, or team projects, avoid teams with a solo woman uh-huh. in, in STEM. And finally, six, a lot of these interventions seem to be particularly effective during these developmental transitions where students oh, are coming in from high school, scholars, just starting. Just to, yeah. yeah. So the, the pipeline leaks at the joints. The joint <sighs> is in those transition points. So when you're going from one part of the pipe to another, it's the joint that leaks. So if we can intervene at the joints, that's when we're most effective. came into social psychology. I chose social psychology over neuroscience in the choice to go to a PhD program in social yeah, rather yeah. than a PhD program in neuroscience right. because I wanted to do research, but that had social justice implications. Oh, so from the very beginning, you were thinking in those terms. Right. And, so and f- that's yeah. so interesting, though, because you chose social psychology to address social justice concerns because, you Why know, we're talking about, well, it wouldn't strike me as obvious that there was a social psych domain of research that's applicable to policy at that early stage. No, so there wasn't. So when I went to graduate school, when I went to Yale, I studied initially with Bob Abelson and then mm. with Mazreen Banaji. And um, both of them were very basic social cognition people. Yeah. So the first two years, I wondered if if the choice if I had made a right choice. Ah, what am it I doing? It felt too basic. Yeah. It felt too basic, too micro. Wow. And it felt like there was a big chasm between the the research I was doing in graduate school and what I wanted to do, which is where I could see its relevance to some problem. Yeah. And in the end, I made my piece sometime around my third year in graduate school and. And sort of the piece I made was that I'm good at this. I like this stuff. I understand the the reason for the method and the causation and ruling out alternative explanations. And I trust that one day I will come back and be able to apply this to domains where the relevance is obvious. So what's interesting to me yeah. Im- immediately about that mm-hmm. is that it suggests to me two commitments, at okay. least two two commitments. One is to sort of issues of social policy and, and, and social justice, yeah. is that fair to say? Yeah. And two is a commitment to science as, a, as, a, yes, as an approach as the, for as, understanding what to do. As a mode of inquiry. Yeah. So the commitment to science, I think was why I got into graduate school rather than becoming a grassroots organizer or a nonprofit right, person right, or right. all these other things I can do. That are all wonderful things. All that they, are wonderful things. Wonderful, important right, things right. to do. So I, I actually gave this distinguished faculty lecture at UMass and I made two points that, that there are two themes that run through my family and that I think 
I've sort of sort of generally inherited that run through my work. One is the value of science. Both uh-huh. my parents are scientists. Both your parents are scientists? Yeah. One is a scientist, one is an engineer. Wow. And the other is that uh, the commitment to social justice, both of my grandparents worked very closely with Gandhi. And my Stop great it. grandmother was a feminist writer. Oh, come on. What I'm are you serious? talking about? Okay, so, I need wait, 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 wait. Okay, we can't just okay, skip over okay, that. All right. So all tell right. me, tell tell me a little bit about your grand, grandparents. Do you mind? No, Do you no, mind not go, at all. Can we go into that history yes, a little yes, bit? Yes. Tell me about that. So my grandparents were very active in the Indian freedom movement. Um, my grandfather was an administrative judge, sort of the first generation of non-British. Indian civil servants, Indian civil service, ICS. Yeah. So the first, gen- the many first generation people were all white Britons, and then suddenly the British Raj decided to allow this group of people, Indians, to become ICS officers. So my grandfather was part of that. Wow. And my grandmother. And when was that? This was nineteen thirty something. Wow. Yeah. So I think the early thirties or the wow. mid thirties. My grandmother was a mathematics master's degree, a person with a master's degree. You're and then, kidding. No, she was in really... India? In India? In the she 30s? Was, she was very... Yeah, she was a... She was, a, she was very what smart. a superstar. But she didn't Holy pursue cow. math, and she essentially became sort of my grandfather's host. But this was in the midst of the Quit India movement, and the World War II was about to... Had just... Was about to begin... And uh, I think Gandhi came to Calcutta, where my grandparents were, and they both got very involved in essentially the civil disobedience movement. My grandfather had to be involved in a very pa- in a passive way because he worked for the British Raj. Yeah. But my grandmother could be very active, so she ended but up still risky. Still risky. So during the Hindu Muslim riots of 1945, she went to, so she and all these other colleagues asked Gandhi, you know, we want to be involved, what should we do? And he essentially said, you have to live the life of civil disobedience, of this life. You, you have to be involved in, in areas where there are these riots. So she took my, her infant, my aunt, oh my and God. went and lived for six months in this, in this village where there were these massive riots going on. Oh, my God. And eventually... Uh, and what did, your, what did your grandpa do during that time? He stayed at home and looked after the rest of the kids and went to work. Holy shit. <laughs> and then he had to send her a letter because India got independence while she was in this, in this village. So he had to send her a letter saying, you should come back home. We are now independent. So anyway, they were very active in that. And my great-grandmother, uh, who was widowed at... I don't know, 30, maybe younger than that, her husband died of cholera, uh, became uh, surreptitiously this this feminist writer who initially wrote anonymously about the poor treatment of women in Indian society in the 1920s, and then later on started using her name and started writing publicly. And what was her name? Her name is Jyotirmoy Devi. Yeah, so she wrote initially in, in Bengali, and now those those books, the short stories and novels, have been translated in multiple languages, including English. So, anyway, so that thread of social justice and the thread of a fam- parents who was a scientist and engineer, I think, in some ways, was sort of in the air and affected. Wow. So, your mother was their child. Yes. Okay. So this is my and, maternal and grandparents. Your, so, yeah. so your your mother grew up to go into the sciences. Yes, she was a biologist. And, uh, wh- yeah. Wow. What, what kind of? Where was? She, where did she do her biology work? She got a, a, a degree in at the University of uh, at Calcutta University. Uh-huh. Um, she was a physiologist. She was she was an right. animal physiologist. Wow. She did all kinds of so work in the fifties, sixties. Um, her degree was, I think, in the nineteen fifties. Let's see, she got married in 1961. So around then, her degree yeah. was probably in 60 or 61. Okay. Yeah. Also before her time. In before many ways. her time. And yeah. I mean, I've talked to, I've yeah. talked to people of that age group yeah. who entered, you know, science yeah. during that time. And it was not an easy scene, even, you know, over here or any, pl- in yeah. any place for, for women during that, those That's years. That's true. I, th- I, I think my maternal side of the family was very intellectual. So it's a family of academics or civil servants. I see. Yeah. So mm-hmm. one uncle was a history PhD, uh, 
one aunt was an economics PhD, one another aunt was a civil servant. So right. it, that side of the family were it was sort of in the family. Wow. So it wasn't a surprise. I mean, it was it was unusual nationally, but in in the context of the family, it was sort of probably normative that you would be you would go and get a degree beyond your bachelor's degree. Okay. And your dad? My dad has his own business. He's an he he he's now retired. He was yeah. an electrical engineer. Electrical engineer. Yeah. So he got his degree, went to work. He got his degree. No, he went to Glasgow. Went to Glasgow. Yeah, and it was too cold and too dark. Yeah, it's too cold and too, too dark, dark there. So How then that he place? then he moved down to the University of London, got a master's <laughs> to in, where it's bright and sunny all the time. <laughs> it's brighter and sunnier than <laughs> Glasgow apparently. Um, <laughs> And then he got his degree, and then he went to Yugoslavia for a year and worked there, and then wow. came back home and got married, and then started his own business. Yeah, so you were born in India? I was born in India. And in Calcutta? In Calcutta. Wow. And how long did you live there? I uh, lived there till I was 18. I came, I, my, my entire primary and secondary education was in India, and then I came to college in the U.S. Uh-huh. And that was at Smith? That was at Smith, 1988, wow. August. And so we're all caught up. August 21, 1988. 1988. How about that? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah. Name. Wow. So, so, okay. So you've got this family, tri- multiple family traditions informing not only a, a sort of political worldview, assuming the, the lineage coming mm-hmm. from Gandhi and civil disobedience mm-hmm. and all that is relatively what we would call liberal, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. sort of, you know, progressive mm-hmm. kind of worldview, but also this grounding in this appreciation for empirical for inquiry, science. for science. That's why we went on this detour yeah. in the story. Yeah. I think the value of science really came from my parents. Yeah. It was all about evidence and ideas. We had more books than we ever had toys. But from my grandparents and great-grandmother came this thing about social justice. Yeah. Um, And I should say I'm making the story up in retrospect. That was not, this was not what I knew in 1988 or 92 or 97. but, But that's what's part of what's fascinating about those kinds of influences is that they just sort of, they just sort of reside in you. Yeah. I mean, we could ask the question, why would you be so interested in science and social justice? Yeah. And it's got to involve this, this pathway, this, this story, whether, yeah. it was, whether it was a sort of deliberate, intentional, conscious thought or not. And it wasn't. You know, there's a famous Steve Jobs uh, quote that says uh, something. He was talking about his, his life where he said, it's only in retrospect when I look back that I can connect the dots. Yeah. I could not connect the dots going forward. Sure. Right, and of course. This is this is exact. I think that that quote really resonates with me because I didn't know these dots existed. I just sort of followed whatever interests seemed intuitively appealing. So you've got this broad, sort of relatively abstract interest yeah. in using science for a, a social good, but what starts shaping it towards what specifically you're studying? So you go to Yale to study social psychology after getting your psychology major at Smith. And you're working with Mazarin. Why? Why why her? I actually worked with Bob first. Oh, that's right. I'm sorry. Right. Yeah, of course. And I was, I think, his last student. He was... Abelson, Abelson. Yeah. So he was retiring, or soon to retire, uh, when I was around uh, doing my master's thesis. And so he suggested that Mazarin and he co-advise me, and I thought that was a great idea. So so the two of them co-advised me, and then when Bob retired, I shifted over entirely to Mazarin. And so... Yeah, go ahead. So that's how I ended up uh, working with her. So in, I was interested in working with her from the beginning. And at Yale in those days, you didn't have to commit to an advisor when I you see. went in. Wow. So you, want, you were admitted into the program. It was entirely up to you when you chose your advisor. Uh, yeah. Um, right. So that's sort of why I didn't have an advisor going in. And then I gravitated toward Abelson and then then worked with both, both of them. And then when Bob retired, worked with Mazarin exclusively. Yeah. Wow. And so w- yeah. w- right away, were you becoming involved, you know, sort of interested in implicit no. in influences no. on behavior and things? Do you remember the weird term entitativity? Yeah. Okay. So I worked on entitativity. Stop it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, no, that's that's right. So I worked on um, how do people perceive groups as being these cohesive, yeah. like Don, Don Campbell, Don that's Campbell stuff. Don Campbell. Yes. Yeah. So how how do perceptual qualities about groups make them seem like a unit rather than yeah. a collection of random individuals? Yeah, so entitativity yeah. was my dissertation, what? and then I got sick of it. Yeah, as um, will happen. As will happen. Right. Yeah. So then I. <laughs> went to uh, University of Washington to work with Tony as his postdoc. Oh, right. And it is then that I completely retooled my area of research yeah. and started working on implicit bias. Another interesting guy. Another Tony interesting Greenwald. Guy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think the combination of Mazarin and Tony was really good for me mm-hmm. because Mazarin is sort of this big vision ideas person and Tony is all about method and rigor and yeah. replication. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the combination was great. But they both believed that implicit attitudes once formed and once formed were formed early and you couldn't change them. And I didn't believe that. And right. I and I sort of did some experiments with an N of one with myself as a participant to try and do these different mental exercises in my own head. And this and was then about I the time... The it, 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 so the IAT was really yes. in development during yes. this period, yeah. right? Yeah, and yeah, there was yeah. a lot of wrangling about the right way to score it and, you know, and things yeah. like so that. Yeah, so 1998 was the first JPSP paper on okay. the, the Greenwald, okay. McGee, and Schwartz. Yeah. And that was when I was Tony's postdoc. I see. And Mazarin and Tony had a grant together, and I, I was funded on that grant. I was an international student, so I couldn't apply for an NRSA. Oh, yeah. So, uh, uh, but I believe that it, I had this this hunch that implicit attitudes could be shifted around. That was not canon at that point. No, that was not, it was not. It was yeah. not just. And Tony not doesn't canon. do well in my experience with with violations of of canon. Yeah, <laughs> it, it it was anti canon. It was not. <laughs> I know. <laughs> it was not neutral. It was anti canon. <laughs> And That's so great. I would spend a lot of time trying to persuade Tony to allow me to test the idea that maybe under the right conditions it could be it could be changed. Yeah. And he wasn't very open to the possibility. <laughs> You're <laughs> kidding me. I know, right? <laughs> So, so all props um, to Tony Greenwald. So I had a bet with. So I <laughs> no, I went behind his back, <laughs> and I collected twenty subjects, Excellent. twenty people, using this intervention, which I created, where I showed people these images of admired African Americans and disliked white Americans with these little two sentence bios, uh-huh. and found that the race bias on an IAT was significantly reduced. Well, it just wasn't. like that simply as a function of seeing those images and then doing a task where just to make sure they had paid attention, I showed them those images and then I had them say which description was true or false. So after doing this for about 10 minutes, then I measured, uh, did had them do an IAT and it was reduced. So at a party, I approached Tony and I said, I have (laughs) these, you know, I have something to tell you. I have these (laughs) 20 subjects. (laughs) I I love sneaking up on him at a party. That's good. No, because Tony was far more relaxed at a party. Yeah, of course. And much more (laughs) more likely to be open to these ideas that he didn't otherwise buy. Sure. (laughs) So he said, "Uh, I don't think it'll work, whatever. I don't think it'll work. Okay, $5. He loves bets. Oh, yeah. $5 bet. $5 bet. I don't think it'll work, but if it works, if it doesn't work, you give me five bucks. And if if it works, I'll give you five bucks. So I said, okay. Um, and he said, even if it works, you can't, it's not going to, it'll fade away really quickly. So his and my first paper, actually the second paper and my most cited paper is this Dasgupta and Greenwald 2001 paper in JPSP, which showed that you can use this counter stereotype exemplar manipulation, showing people positive racial exemplars of one group uh, and negative racial exemplars of another group or do the same thing for age and reduce implicit race bias in one experiment, age bias in another experiment. I brought them back into the lab on day two without any reminder of the intervention and the 
and the reduction in bias was still there. How about that? I wonder if it was bound to context. Yes, in that study it could be. But in subsequent studies, once I finished my postdoc, we found that contact, so in another study we found that people who had lots of contact with uh, individuals who are LG- LGBT, uh-huh. who are co-workers or friends or family members, that positive contact correlated beautifully with lower anti-gay bias on an IAT. Yeah. We also found that this media exposure manipulation, it really worked well with people who had no contact with the media exposure manipulation being the the thing that you had done in the lab, trying to reduce racial, negative racial bias. Then we applied it to anti-gay bias. Uh And we found that for people who had no contact with uh, gays and lesbians, that media exposure to now admired gay and lesbian individuals reduced anti-gay bias but the media exposure had no effect on people who knew gay people in their in their everyday life because they, they showed because, low, showed because low, there was a there was a floor. there was close to a, it wasn't a floor effect but they were significantly lower in bias and they didn't go down anymore mm. So they were sort of fixed. Media exposure did nothing. Interesting. Those who came in with no contact showed a high bias, and then they came down. Wow. Um, so you got your five bucks? I got my five bucks. Yeah. I got a paper. What did you do with it? I, <laughs> I should have saved it. I should have saved, saved it. Yeah, you should have saved it. I love this story because, yeah. because, um, <laughs> because that was my... It actually really... Uh, made me realize that you can be a new person in a field and have an intuition that can go completely against the canon, yeah. but can actually be right. Sometimes I even think that a little naivete is a really is a good, good thing. thing. I agree. Because you don't know what you're not supposed to ask. This is kind of partly why I like to talk to people who are not social psychologists and sometimes not academics because the questions they'll ask sometimes send me on a path that I hadn't thought of before. Ah, yeah. And that's been gratifying. I mean, just the, to loop back to the beginning of our conversation, it's gratifying to just disseminate our science to yeah. the general public because the practice of dissemination generates more science. And oftentimes it generates the uh, ability to do the science in the real world. Because people will come up and say, I really like that, but I wonder if it would work in a school with an adolescent population. And I'll say, well, if you can find me that school, and oh, I'm a principal of so-and-so school. Our school is a research school. If you want to do a study, and well, then that start, started the next grant. So wait, how long are you at uh, Washington? Two years. Two years? Just two years? Just two years. So 98? 97 to 99. 97 to 99, and then, yeah. and then you're at and Amherst? Then I, no, and then I went to the new school for social research. Oh, in New York for, City. In New York City for three and a half years, and then I moved to UMass in and, and 2003. So by the time you get to UMass, you're still not doing this latest stuff. It was in, at the new school, I had a student who... So the new school is an unusual thing. Graduate students essentially have real regular jobs. Right. And they're trying to make a career shift. And so the classes are all in the evening. Right. The reason I'm telling you the story is I had a graduate student who was essentially a counseling psychologist at a women's college. And she had this idea that the same sort of seeing positive counter-stereotypic exemplars could reduce gender bias or gender stereotyping, uh, stereotypes about who is a good leader. Who's a good leader. Yeah. If for for women who went to a women's college, more so than women who went to a co-ed college, because you're more likely to see women in positions of leadership. Yeah, you're not seeing the, you know, it has its own organic yeah. dynamic that and way. And the president of the college is more likely to be a woman, the yeah. deans and so on. So we took our laptops, they did IATs, but they did, did they? it but they did it in their camp on their campus, yeah. on our laptops. Wow. That's so we wanted to measure does coming into a college environment where there are women in leadership change these women's implicit uh, beliefs about gender and leadership. Uh-huh. And does that change over time as a function of how long they are in college? Yeah. We, so we compared a women's college and a co-ed college, only women. Yeah. At time one, when they came into the college, the first, we, uh, the first uh, month of college, there was no difference in gender stereotypes. The um, first month, the looking first, at the two different colleges. Looking at the two different yeah, colleges. Yeah. So these are first-year students just walking into college. Right, right. The, the, the students at the co-ed college, their gender stereotypes went up. The kids at the women's college, their gender stereotype went down. 
But the reason I came upon the STEM work is because we found this weird effect that for students, for these women at the co-ed college, the more math and science courses they took, the more the stronger the gender stereotypes. Wow. And I thought that's weird. That doesn't make any why would that why, why, why would why that would a be? specific kind of course? So then I looked at who was teaching those courses and disproportionately their faculty in STEM courses were men. So then I thought, oh this is interesting. So we put that in the paper, but then I was ruminating on it and thinking, if seeing male faculty, mostly male faculty, strengthens gender stereotypes, would that spill over and affect what they thought they think that they can do themselves? And so I was thinking about that, that do our professors affect what we do? Does our similarity with them then bleed over into what we feel we can do? If we're very different from them, do we think that we can't do it? None of this showed up on our explicit measures. They only showed up on these IATs and when we did a frequency count of who their professors were by gender. Wow. So I was so then I started That's thinking incredible. about about uh, stereotypes and how it might unknowingly affect the course of someone's selection of major, their self-efficacy, their motivation, their career trajectory and and so <laughs> which, that's how which it happened. already we're talking about you know people talk about a lot especially in social psychology yeah. they talk they talk about this sort of you know the 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 putative or the the theoretically relevant uh effect of sm cumulative small effects yeah. but what you're talking about is leading to a, a decision you're talking about you're talking about putting people on the trajectory toward, down a decision tree yes and yeah. each branch of that tree is a major effect yeah and that the person may be unaware unaware they might tell themselves whatever right right they i think their personal experience is that something like my interest changed yeah. or this is too theoretical and, or whatever it is and did any did you ever talk to, to the, these students at any point to figure out what, what are they? No, I wish I had. It's because this was not what we were after. Yeah, we were not sure. looking at science and math, we, but we happened to measure what courses were they taking, yeah. who were their professors, what was the content of the courses. And it's only when we found <coughs> this surprising effect that students who took more science and math showed stronger gender stereotypes at the co-ed college, not at the women's college. By, th by that time, our study had long finished. We were in the middle of analyzing the data and writing the paper, and this was sort of an unexpected finding. It was not the central piece of our paper. Yeah. Then we realized, oh, actually, it's connected to the central thesis because it's these women who, have mo who are more likely at the co-ed college to have male professors. The, the students who are taking social science classes, humanities classes, are more likely to have a mix of gender uh, in terms of their faculty. But the students who are taking math, science, computer science had mostly male professors. And so this was sort of a side story illustrating how who faculty are that students see in front of the class can affect their perceptions of who makes a good leader. But it was not connected to science and engineering. And this was still at, at New School? This was still at New School. Yeah, wow. This was still, but this was when the this idea, is the seed. this is the seed. This is the ah, seed. And so this is... It's very exciting. This is 2004. Yeah. So by now, I had just moved to, the, to UMass. I was thinking of writing a grant. And I had already decided that the grant had to do with something to do with essentially the malleability of implicit bias, but now applied to the self not to perceptions of others, wow. which had been my prior work. I love that. Applied to the self. Applied to the self. Yeah. Because that is a complete inversion. That's I mean, right. It, that doesn't show up anywhere in that literature until Yes. Then. And it didn't show up then. I mean, there was a stereotype threat work. Right. Yes, but right. That's, it's a little bit different. It's, it's different. Yeah. Yeah. Because in Claude Steele's hypothesis, stereotype threat is really all about somebody else's perception of you, right. which raises worries, anxieties, yeah. whatever, and then affects your performance, but you don't believe it. Right. Whereas right. in what I wanted to pursue is that it gets internalized. What does the environment teach me about yes. myself? How does, the environment, how, how does the environment leave an imprint on my self-concept and I don't even know that imprint exists? 
Wow. I think I'm, make, I'm the driver. I'm the captain of my ship. But actually, it's the context. Well, as a fellow scientist and as a father of two small girls. Oh, you are? Yeah, four and six. This is one of my most inspirational conversations. And thanks so much for talking I'm to me. I'm very glad. <laughs> I'm very glad. I hope your, your daughters benefit from you and have your spirit. Well. I don't know how the heck you're doing this <laughs> when you have a four and a six-year-old. Yeah, I don't either. <laughs> but I'm glad I'm doing wow. it. I wouldn't trade this for anything. Yeah. All right, thanks. You're welcome. Okay, that's it. Thanks to Nilanjana Dasgupta for so candidly chatting with me at that lovely upstate New York conference setting for letting me uh, ambush her, really. I mean, when, when I realized she was there, I did not want to let her get away without recording something like this, and she was very generous with her time. So thank you, Nalanjana. I owe you one. All right? Folks, the music on Circle of Willis is written by Tom Stoffer and Gene Ruley and performed by their band, The New Drakes. For information about how to purchase their music, check the About page at circleofwillispodcast.com. Circle of Willis is produced by Siva Vijanathan and brought to you by VQR and the Center for Media and Citizenship at the University of Virginia. And Circle of Willis is a member of the TEJ FM network. You can find out more about that at teej.fm. Special thanks to Nathan Moore, general manager and swell guy at WTJU FM in Charlottesville, Virginia, and Lulu Miller, plucky genius co-founder of the podcast Invisibilia, and reporter for NPR News. If you like this podcast, how about giving us a little review at iTunes, letting us know how we're doing. It's super easy and we like it. Or send us an email by going to circleofwillispodcast.com and clicking the contact tab. In any case, I'll see you all at episode 14, where I talk with Susan Johnson, professor emeritus of psychology at the University of Ottawa in Canada up there where she's also a member of the Order of Canada, which is Canada's highest civilian honor. She's going to tell us the story of developing emotionally focused therapy, one of the most widely used and widely studied therapies ever developed for treating distressed romantic couples. Until then, bye-bye. Bye-bye.